your uh, co-host. Oh, all right. I don't, I don't, uh, <laughs> you won't catch me snoring. Uh, I'm sorry. I just realized that I had forgotten to start my recording. Um, we tend to see spirit, uh, you know, we, you know, people use the word spirit and soul interchangeably, but there's a quote that I love to use from the Dalai Lama that illustrates um, the differences between these. And the Dalai Lama says, I call the high light aspects of my being spirit and the dark heavy aspects soul. Soul is at home in the deep shaded valleys, heavy torpid flowers saturated with black grow there. Spirit is the land of high white peaks and glittering jewel like lakes and flowers. People need to climb the mountain, not simply because it's there, but because soulful divinity needs to be mated with spirit. So what he's talking about is the path of return, the arc of ascent, the spiritual path, right? This happens after many, many lifetimes of experience. And through that experience, there's evolution of consciousness, right? And this happens through many, many lifetimes. And, and then at some point, on the journey, as one is involuted, gone through this process of involution, turning away and forgetting the source and becoming completely immersed in the material world as if, and forgetting, as if this is the only reality, um, at some point it turns, it, it hears a higher calling right? It hears what they call in esoteric traditions, the call of return. And that begins the path of initiation, which we call the spiritual path. And the spiritual path then is the arc of ascent. So this diagram in itself is a diagram of the entire cycle of your individuated spark and how it step, has stepped away from the divine, but part of the plan, right? It's not a, again, like I said, various religions and mythologies attempt to describe this, um, but you know, it is part of the plan. It is part of the divine's desire to separate from itself and then return to itself through and through our immersion, our individuated immersion within the material, bringing back that experience to the divine in each of our own many, many lifetimes, but each of our own unique ways, right? Which then enriches the divine's experience of itself. Again, back to the collective, back to the trans, transpersonal. So when I talk about the primordial wound, this is happening here, right? And as I said, Chiron can be seen as a representation of this primordial wound in that the pain of this separation is the pain of separation and how it was first interpreted in one's own individuated consciousness um, even as the Veda said, right, spirit is more of the plane of mind or consciousness, we would say, the indwelling spark. So self-awareness first happens here, right? But it's self-awareness in the sense of consciousness itself. So at this point of separation, what I have found in regression, working with people through this, cleaning up the karmic mess of the incarnating soul through the ego body through many, many, many lifetimes, it started to happen with some clients that they spun back all the way back to this initial separation. Um, and then some kind of aha went off in me as I could start to look at how that related to Chiron, Pluto, and the nodes, which is the basic, you know, Pluto in the nodal axis is, is the basic um, outline of um, evolutionary astrology. So combined, these signatures show the big picture of all of this, right? And we'll, like I said, I'm going to get more into the weeds of that um, tomorrow. 
Um, let me see if I have more. Does this make sense? Should I stop and ask questions or I can keep going? I don't know how you guys usually do it. Okay, I'll just keep going. If you have it's questions. Totally, Patricia, it's totally the way you want to do it. You can you can ask questions, you can wait till a point. It's it's totally up to you. Okay. Um so one thing, you know, in, in the Dalai Lama's statement, what he's talking about is that spirit remains to a certain degree untouched by earthly experience. It is separated from the divine and it is and it has gone through that separation and imprinted an original interpretation of that primordial um, separation. And as I said, in my research, I, I found that the signature of Chiron echoes back to that original imprint, that plane of mind where consciousness made some kind of conclusion about what it meant to be separated from the divine. And then that informs because it hits this band of cause and effect, right? that then sets into motion all of the um the subsequent experience that happens through these and then informs many lifetimes like i said this is chiron's action working with pluto in the nodes um okay i think that's enough of that so virgil said that easy is the descent to hell all night long, all day, the doors of dark Hades stand open. But to retrace the path, to come out again to the sweet air of heaven, there is the task, there is the burden. And again, this is what the Dalai Lama was talking about. At some point in our journey, we need to start to climb back out of the underworld, right? This plane of existence to kind of taste that that sweet air of heaven, that is the task. And when we talk about the task, think about it this way. It's a lot easier to go down than it is to go up, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, sometimes falling is easier than it is to get up. Like we often say, you know, if you fall, if you falter and you make a mistake, get up again. But not everybody does that, right? So we fall. And then um, the effort that it takes to get up um, sometimes stops us, right? And we stay at that stage of the fall. Maybe it's frozen in fear. Or we broke our leg. <laughs> you know, it could be any of those reasons. Um, you know, so if you look at this picture, you can see climbing up takes effort. This is this after this many, many lives of the soul some some um, healing, some rectification of ego to soul to spirit needs to start to happen. And all of that work is the work of the path of return. It is the work of evolution. Um, it also, you know, in my view, it's easier to go down because the other side of that is the way down was forged by the divine desire to know itself. It's almost like the blueprint is there. The divine desire to cast off a spark from itself, individuated sparks, and throw them deep into matters so they would forget the source. That's part of the plan. So the divine um, primordial urge, right, or desire, as the Vedas say, um, created the way down. So it's easier to follow the way down. The, the, the difficulty lies in the return. And the reason why is because the return is forged by each individual's effort. And this is also echoed in other creation stories, specifically the one of Sophia that I mentioned before, um, but I don't, I'm not gonna go into that. Um, and, and it, so, you know, we have gurus and teachers and those who are enlightened that attempt to point us to the way of return because that's been their path and it worked for them. 
It doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> that that's the path for everybody, but the point is there are many paths to choose from. And yes, these ones that have gone before us, the Jesuses and the Buddhas and the avatars that have gone before us that come to um, show us the way, right? They are ones that give us guidelines, but each step on the journey up is forged by individual effort. This is when we pass through that ring pass knot of cause and effect, the first thing that occurs is the creation of free will, right? So this is the real meaning of free will, that once we have that and cause and effect is set into motion, then free will becomes operative. Um, okay, so that's kind of the big overarching picture. And I'm going to take you through the myth in a moment and show you how Chiron's story also illustrates some of what I've been talking about. Uh, but just let's talk a little bit about the, um, the physical asteroid of Chiron. So uh, one of the earlier writings on Chiron was Barbara Han Clow and of course, Melanie Reinhardt. But Barbara Han Clow called Chiron the rainbow bridge. And the reason why she did that is because Chiron has this elliptical orbit that passes um, inside uh, the, the ring of Saturn or, or Saturn's orbit, kind of giving a little wave to Jupiter there, and then comes outside and touches onto Uranus, slightly passing outside, kind of giving a little wave to Neptune over there. But this bridge between Saturn and Uranus, as has been said in uh, you know, more philosophical astrology or, or even archetypal astrology, is the understanding that you know, the rings of Saturn represent the boundary of, of consciousness or the boundary of matter as it exists, uh, as consciousness as it exists in matter. Um, and and the and Chiron, the one traveling between these, um, is 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 part of the clue of how to break out of these rings to this path of liberation of Uranus here, which Uranus and is the gateway then to the rest of the outer planets to transpersonal that which is beyond the personal. Now, astronomically speaking, Chiron isn't, a, a, it's not a planet, because astronomically speaking, I should say, Chiron isn't a planet because it's too small and it's been reclassified many, many times. Um, it shows a comet-like behavior when it comes close to the sun, but it, it's classified today as a minor planet and a comet. It was um, first identified as a kind of new class of bodies. Here you can see, um, you know, the asteroid belt where it's said to have originated from, um, although that's kind of still debated, believe it or not, of where Chiron actually originated from. Uh, and you can see Chiron here, you know, as this would be, um, you know, it's, it's kind of orbiting around in here. Um, Chiron was known as, a, it was discovered in 1977 and it was known as a maverick because it did this. <laughs> Unlike everything else, right, that's doing this, it did that. Um, so it was known to kind of be a maverick. Uh, and for like 15 years, it kind of held that status until, um, until the, the rest of what's called the centaurs that we now know of is a whole other you know, series of asteroids. Phallus was the first one discovered in 1992. Um, and there, the, the, so this whole population of asteroids that, all, and I don't have a diagram of that up here, but they all have eccentric orbits, right? So you would see Phallus and Nessus and all of these different centaurs. But for, for almost 20 years, Chiron carried that, um, that designation as being the kind of, you know, oddball here and the maverick because, and, and um, Pluto does the same thing too, um, because of its elliptical orbit as seen from earth and the way that it appears through the zodiac belt, it spends the most time in Aries and the least time in Libra. Um, 
you know, I see that kind of archetypally as Aries is that point, the absolute beginning of the zodiacal wheel and the kind of severing when one falls out of the cosmic womb of Pisces, right? The cord is severed in Aries, which rules knives, right? <laughs> you know, and sharp objects. The, the umbilical cord is severed and one then arrives as the individual being, right? So Aries and that point on the ascendant is that kind of, you know, some associated with, with actually how one is born too, that we can look to the ascendant and see characteristics of one's birth by what sign is on the ascendant or aspects or planets around there. So that severing from the, the cosmic wound and falling into separation to me um, represents a bit of um, also Chiron's archetypal meaning as an astronomical body. In, in the 1970s, when Chiron was discovered, and we find this a lot, just like when Pluto was discovered, um, the, the resurgence of depth psychology or the initiation of the discovery of the depths of the human psyche took place with both Jung and Freud. Um, when Chiron was discovered, you know, it, it was right after the counterculture movement of the 60s. And so that backlash of, or, or the forward lash, because I wouldn't say it's a backlash, although it acted first as a backlash, but the forward impetus carrying forward from the 60s into the 70s from the counterculture movements brought about a whole resurgence of interestingly neo-paganism, neo-shamanism, um, earth-based traditions, and also the humanistic and transpersonal movements were born then or um, solidified um, as institutions, right? Transpersonal had been around before, but it wasn't understood as a separate body of psychology. It actually was institutionalized, uh, formally institutionalized in the 70s. So all of that was part of, in the 70s, what was called the 70s into the 80s, the human potential movement. Um, this is also important in, as part of Chiron's myth, which you'll see in a moment. Um, the rulership, Chiron's rulership is debated in modern astrology, and I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow. Um, I've said it before, but I, I believe that Chiron's rulership doesn't really fit in one sign, but it fits in the whole mutable axis. Um, and there's, you, you, I'll talk about that more. Uh, no, sorry, not tomorrow, Saturday. Okay, so let's talk about Chiron the myth. Uh, the first thing I wanna say, this is really interesting in putting together slides, there are very few classical paintings of Chiron. And I, it's just interesting to me how Chiron did not capture the imagination of so many artists. Some of the more popular paintings of Chiron through the classical arts are Chiron um, when he was tutoring Achilles. And I, you know, every uh, you, do a Google search yourself and go Chiron mythology, classical art, and see what you come up with, right? Um, and the reason why I'm looking for classical art is because I'm looking for things that are public domain that I can use in a presentation. Uh, and, and so Chiron and Achilles is interesting. Um, but also interesting why that was the main subject of so much classical art. And, you know, Chiron and Achilles, which I'm not going to talk about that much, although the Achilles heel, you can start to associate with Chiron and understand that from the Achilles myth, that Achilles mother tried to immortalize him by dipping him into the river Styx and his heel was wounded. Um, and becoming immortalized is a big part of Chiron's myth. He was an immortal himself, um, uh, but I digress. <laughs> so <clears throat> the paintings though, Chiron had a, a curious relationship with Achilles. And if you look at a lot of these classical paintings, they're, um, you know, they're kind of homoerotic, right? And what's interesting about that is that Chiron as the centaur, you know, represents this kind of um, fusion, 
right, of animal and human nature. But in modern society, the animal nature is looked down upon. And I think that the illusion of the allusion, not illusion, the, allude, the, the myth and how it alludes to Chiron's relationship with Achilles, um, you know, being homosexual, that that is what stirred the interest of the classical painters, right? Because either they had repressed their own urges, right? Or it's, or it's, it's, it's actually a kind of um, expression of, you know, the repression of society as a whole, which is a big part of Chiron's story. Anyway, that's an aside. I just wanted to share that. Um, so Kronos or Saturn is Chiron's father. And in the myth, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Kronos is searching for his son um, and, and Rhea, oh, hold on a second, my dog. And Rhea is hidden Chiron because um, Kronos has had a habit of gobbling up his children. <laughs> so Rhea hides him. Now I just want to stop here for a moment in recognizing Saturn Kronos is associated with chronological time. Saturn is mortality. Again, remembering the thing that I showed you, the, the bounds of mortality, uh, as we know, the, the ruler of Capricorn. Time itself consumes life force when you think about it. Once, you know, once you're incarnated, as soon as you're born, you're dying, right? <laughs> so um, it's interesting that the, it, it, it's a consequence of when the immortal um, subjects itself to mortality. So in the myth, um, Kronos is, a, 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 excuse me, attracted to Phileras. She's a nymph, a, a water nymph. She's one of the Oceanad nymphs. And to escape him, she turns herself into a mare, into a horse. But, you know, there's different versions of the myth, but the short story is that Kronos does the same um, and successfully mates with her. But the outcome then is Chiron, half human, half horse. And Phileros, when Chiron is born, so then Kronos takes off, right? So Chiron never has a father or a father that sticks around. Um, and Phileros, um, um, when she gives birth to this half horse, half human, she sees it as a monster. And she begs the gods to turn her into, to hide from it, to turn her into anything <clears throat> other than a human so she wouldn't be recognized. She gets turned into a linden tree. But, you know, at the very beginning of Chiron's life, he's abandoned. He's abandoned not just by the mother, but the father. Um, so first, let's look at Chiron's dual nature. So it can be looked at, and it has been looked at philosophically and archetypally as human nature over animal. And that's more of a, um, well, I would say a patriarchal view. We can also look at it as the fusion of matter and spirit, the fusion of the material and the spirit and all that that entails, everything that comes in between, like the diagram I showed you. <clears throat> so in mythology, you know, it certainly does um, associate the centaurs with wildness and instinctual because they are completely uncivilized. Chiron is the only one who's known as the civilized centaur, the gentlest of all beings he's called. Um, but we can also say, you know, they call him the civilized centaur. We can also say that our cre that human's creation of civilization is anything but civil. I mean, you know, look around you. We might say that our kind of playing God or, you know, creating order out of what we may see as chaos or bringing our own creative nature to the material by founding civilizations in the way that we have, I'm not saying it's the only way, but in the way that we have is part of the wound. 
because we've become estranged from the instinctual in that process, right? We believe our creation is the reality and that estranges us from natural law. So to become civilized in the way that we have created civilizations equals repressing one's instinctual authentic self. Um, and Chiron offers a redemption from that. Um, so it isn't human consciousness over animal. It's the mystery of what can be brought out of the fusion of that. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the centaur um, is often associated with Sagittarius also, um, although Chiron apparently did not become the Sagittarius constellation in his myth. Um, he became Centaurus, um, but Sagittarius is the other centaur, or the centaur of the zodiacal wheel. Um, in Sagittarius is what's known as the galactic center around 27 degrees Sagittarius. In many um, indigenous traditions, from everywhere, from like the Mayans to Native Americans to the Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal. In these mythologies, um, or in their spiritual belief systems, the center, the galactic center was known to them, um, not by their physical eyes, but by their interconnectedness, as the source of all life, where all souls come from and where they return. I'm sorry, my dog is um, barking at something. Um, where all souls come from and where they return. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> I'm just gonna I'm just gonna turn this off and yell at him, okay? <laughs> Okay, I think I've got that under control now. <laughs> um, so the, 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 the center of the, this galactic center is known in some traditions at the, as the womb at the center of the universe. And like I said, it's where all souls come from and all souls return. Um, it's also the source of cosmic creative intelligence and all that is to be known, can be known and will be known emanates from this galactic center. Um, you know, one might say that it's the wisdom that guides, uh, it, the wisdom that guides life on earth. So, um, you know, the centaur then as, and Chiron as the centaur, um, or as the figure of the centaur, resonates to this um, source of separation and return, right? <clears throat> so the, 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 the um, animal and human fusion, you know, we can say that that's instinct um, fused with intelligence and reason, but the shape-shifting nature or this shape-shifting nature of Chiron is also um, gives an illusion or a nod to shamanism which is again, as I was talking about the indigenous wisdom, this is the root of all of our archaic um, ancestral wisdom. And all of the mythologies that we carry in astrology today, generally the Greco-Roman, they have predecessors. And it's said that in that region around Sumeria and then Greece and, and Rome, et cetera, that there was a universal shamanistic view of, um, of uh, you know, spirituality and of life. I mean, this used to be the global belief system, this the shamanistic um, understanding that human is fused with nature and not separate from, that the oneness that existed maybe in that primordial state is also to be found here right, that we are not separate from it. So these mythologies had predecessors 
it's said that in in um, <clears throat> Bon uh, Tibetan Buddhism and um, Egypt precursors both to the Greco-Roman. Um, what I find interesting about those two traditions and where it's said that some of the shamanistic root starts to come through in their particular teachings and mythologies is that both of those traditions had books of the dead, right? So in Tibetan Buddhism, it's the Bardo Kadol, and in Egypt, it's called the Egyptian books of the dead. Um, some of that is echoed in some of the earliest myths of Inanna and her descent into the underworld. Um, and later in Persephone and her part of the Eleusinian mysteries, which is part of the Greek mystery schools. The core of the teaching of the books of the dead is how to unify the different parts of the spiritual and soul bodies, the or <clears throat> as I showed you in the diagram before, the different the different separations on the planes of matter, how to rectify all of the experience and memory there and unify all of those energy bodies to attain, to, to do that after death, to attain immortality, right? Or return to the source. So it's interesting that this, the, you, we can start to see, and again, as the myth goes on, you'll see that there's, um, that, that, that Chiron's story carries some of this resonance as well. So Chiron's fusion here, rather than being an either or, or human over, um, describes more an alchemical process, right? It's an alchemical fusion. It's a symbol of the great work. It's a symbol of the great marriage, the culmination of the fruition of spirit and matter, um, which then is the reconciliation of spirit and matter, right? That is the achievement of immortality or the truth of immortality. Chiron is immortal, um, but he's immortal, <clears throat> but his immortality as we find in the myth is not the ultimate, right? He's immortal on the physical plane. Um, but again, that's not the great, you know, that's not um, the best thing to be. Um, as the myth shows us, it's kind of um, life in the eternal, eternal immortality in the afterlife is what's really being sought. Um, hold on a second. So, Chiron as the center here, as the centaur, also kind of symbolizes this, um, or the fact that we are bound to material law, the natural world, light and dark, duality, right? Um, and so we have this, yet another part of us has the capacity to escape duality, to unify the worlds. Again, this is what you know the whole path of spirituality is about right to find the oneness in the many <clears throat> or the diversity uh, so centaurs <clears throat> in mythology represent the desire nature um, but also we forget that the desire that the desire nature comes from the divine and that it was initially the divine's desire to separate from itself, right? So in its doing, it planted the seed of separation and return. That's the dual desires that exist, right? We can, all, we can kind of say that Chiron as the centaur and as the sentient centaur, the conscious centaur represents that, represents these dual desires. Are they at war? within oneself or are they fused? Um, again, you know, there's no original sin, at least I'm, I'm, I, I guess I can't say for certain in Pat's cosmology, there's no original sin. We weren't cast out from the garden for eating the fruit of knowledge. The plan of separation, evolution and return is a plan, right? Um, 
it's just a matter of time. Uh, it's just a matter of how long you've been on the karmic wheel as to when the return stage is happening. Now, the other thing that, you know, I was saying before, uh, Chiron from birth is an orphan. So the pain and loss of that um, in, the myth, in the myth echoes to what I was talking about of this primordial wound, the, the wound of separation that's echoed through every incarnation. Um, and it gets replayed life after life after life. You know, for about 20, 30 years, I've worked with a shamanic healer and some of the core work that she does um, in the beginning when she works with people, she calls source of love work. And she describes that work as touching into this place where we have, um, to a certain degree, what I'm talking about, where we have separated and maybe misinterpreted what that separation meant, which then set into cause and effect all of the different experiences that we have with all of our sources of love. And that would be you know, our primary source of love, life to life, is parents, lack of parents, right, or whoever the parent figure is. And those are, can all be representations. So if you look at your own life and your childhood, there, there, is, there is an echo, right, of that primordial separation in the circumstances of your current life, just by looking at your childhood, right? Um, and I'll explain to you the energetic component of Chiron and how it echoes through there later. But my, my point is that um, part of her work was to kind of touch into that place and work on the healing of that. Um, and, you know, I can say that as many lifetimes, lifetime after lifetime, as we get caught in this illusion and this Maya, right, and we get caught in woundedness, we then continue to recreate it, right? And that's a whole other discussion, but the nature of tra trauma is repetition. So this is part of the soul's journey. The soul then creating this, you know, memory of what happened, the permanent atom on each plane that, like I said, that grand cycle, the cosmic cycle is also the individual cycle, life after life but we don't abandon the previous life. If you remember the diagram, that permanent atom on each plane records that experience. So that when we, you know, when we leave the physical body, right? And then we shed the um, e uh, emotional body and then the mental body, right? And then the ego and whole, its memory remains there in the permanent atoms, right? And then, you know, consciousness is then extracted into soul consciousness, but that is also the social ancestral, the collective, and then the karmic band. We don't return to source after every lifetime, right? <laughs> I mean, it would be great if we did, but we don't, right? We're weighted to the, the because of that band of cause and effect, we are weighted to the um, consequences of cause and effect. And they call us back into incarnation time after time. So that when soul then reclothes itself, it picks up where it left off. It's like when you leave the house, you put on your jacket, um, you know, when you go out and then you come home and you hang up the jacket, right? But when you go out again, you put on the jacket. That's kind of what the soul does, but it clothes itself in each one of these, um, picking up where it left off, basically, these koshas, um, these different subtle bodies. So, you know, healing that primordial wound, <clears throat> because it's re-echoed so many times, like I said, in regression therapy, I've seen it over and over, um, that we need to clean out the karmic closet a lot to liberate ourselves enough to even realize that there's another potentiality rather than what our soul has been recreating. Um, my Chiron, just in brief, is in Pisces in the 12th house, like I mentioned, 
but an aspect in opposition to Pluto Uranus and both of those are square my moon. So you can imagine that somewhere in my primordial moon story, <laughs> and I could tell you that tomorrow, there's some uh, wounding about this uh, feeling abandoned, feeling kicked out, right? Um, and then how that relates to the mother wound. Well, I was adopted in this life, given up for birth. And I can tell you that I can track that back. I can track back this childhood to the impression of that was impressed upon my spirit or that my spirit conjured at the point of separation. I can track that back from the present to the, you know, epics of, of whatever you would call them. It's, it's hard to say to even use the constraints of time in describing these things because it's not quite accurate. Um, but we can track from the present to the past. And it wasn't until I, now I was adopted and I was adopted by really loving, caring parents, right? Like the kind of parents everybody would want. Had I stayed with my adopted family as I came to learn, my life would have been hell with a capital H. So I, you know, my Chiron conjuncts Jupiter, right? <laughs> I was like, yay, I was saved by grace. Um, but my point being that even with that condition created in this lifetime, I can honestly tell you, I was never able to feel the love that my parents gave me. And it wasn't until I dove deep into my own karma and deep into the primal wound, right? Which the primal wound, again, that which is repeated life after life over from our sources of love, various sources of love, those primal wounds, um, until I went into the pain of that um, and then back to the source is when I had a breakthrough. And I mean, I remember, you know, talking to my father, sobbing on my knees. I must have been in my 30s or something when I, you know, finally had this catharsis after working on this wound. And I was on my knees sobbing, saying, I, I can't believe that I never could feel the love that you gave me. Um, and this is the kind of work that it takes. This is the kind of work that Chiron points to. You know, it takes not turning from the wound, but, and I'll talk about this in a moment, um, it takes the willingness to go into the underworld, right? The willingness to um, go into the underworld of the psyche, to dredge up, to bring to light, to consciousness, thus to resolution, that which has been repressed there, that which has been held there by Saturn's rings. Um, again, Saturn, Uranus, Uranus is a symbol of liberation. Um, so the civilizing wound, this, or we, you know, in essence, we can civilize the wound. We can make it work for us. Um, and, and that's part of the meaning of that. That's part of Chiron's wound is to make it work for us. But the deeper mystery is to be able to, like I said, re reunify the wound by um, rectifying it back to source by actually consciously entering into it, right? And in doing that to release it from manifestation altogether so that then maybe another story can, can start. Um, one thing I wanna say about this, um, when, when I was talking about that primordial separation, you know, even in Chiron transits, when I've looked at Chiron transits in my own life, in relation to karma, the interesting thing, and I have always said this, that a Chiron transit bringing about a wound is never, it's not the same as a recreation of the actual karmic circumstances. That happens more with Pluto and the nodes where they bring the actual people back into your life or the actual circumstances are replayed. I've always noticed that Chiron is more like, it's like an echo. 
it's like a similar situation, but it's not the same people. It's not the same situation. Um, <clears throat> and this, you know, this, this echoes to how that primordial wound, which again, I'll talk more about um, on Saturday in the workshop, how that primordial wound is this essence that trickles through all of those planes kind of cult that's the first coloring and that how that then informs one's life after life but it isn't necessarily the cause of the karma mm, well i don't know it's another discussion um one thing i think uh, you know as as i contemplated this chiron lecture that i kept hearing Einstein's um, uh, quote that God doesn't play dice with the universe. But then the counter of that came up, you know, that means basically meaning that there is a plan that, you know, there isn't this, it's not a random arising. Um, but in the Vedic philosophy, counter to that, or in conjunction with that, I would say, um, the, you know, the idea is that the universe is the play of the Lord. It is the role of the dice, right? It's, it's called Leila. It's the play of the divine. And so this also relates to this separation from spirit. Like, you know, there's a plan, but it's not all planned out, right? This is free will. It is the role of the dice. It's like the divine throws off one divine spark and says, okay, go do your thing, you know, pass through cause and effect and then see what happens, right? And then the rest of it's kind of generated from that individuated being, that, you know, that monad, that spirit. And then there goes another one and another one and another one. Okay, so there is a bit of playing dice with the universe. Um, <clears throat> so Chiron, um, from you know the parts that I just correlated here, orphaned at birth, you know, being the representation of this uh, fusion of human and animal, um, becomes as he was known as the gentlest and the wisest of the centaurs. Uh, he gets adopted by Apollo, right? Who's also known as Helios and the Sun. He gets adopted by Apollo, and in, you know, and, and, and his sister um, Artemis, who teach him all of these um, arts of civilization, let's say, uh, hunting and uh, medicine, and specifically Chiron specialized also in surgery and music and prophecy and also astrology. So Chiron becomes very learned under Apollo and Artemis's um, tutorage. Now in this part of the myth, you know, in, in Greek mythology are all stories, you know, we can look at the story as individual characters, but as I'm sure a lot of you know, the individual characters are all part of, you know, the story, right? So they have their own roles, but they represent something about quite frequently about the main character or the, 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 the intention of the myth. So Apollo here, you know, is representing the sun, this indwelling consciousness, the original spark, spirit. Artemis, interestingly, is a goddess of the wilds, right? She, she is um, the lady of the beasts, right? Sometimes also associated with Diana. Uh, and she um, sees over, interestingly, she's a virginal goddess, so she doesn't give birth, but she sees over midwifing of souls, midwifing of babies. Um, this is also interesting because I think that this, this process, as we know that Chiron in the mythology is also associated in modern times as the wounded healer. Um, and this, this part of you know going through your pain and then being the midwife to others to help them birth parts of their soul i think is you know also very important um part of this myth and artemis's representation there in some versions of the myth artemis actually bestows wisdom upon chiron by placing her hand on his head 
Now Chiron became, and you know, here he is with Achilles, <laughs> as I mentioned before, but he became a tutor to many classical heroes. Um, Jason, Achilles, Hercules, um, Asclepius, etc. There were a lot of them. And one of his main gifts as a teacher was the ability to bring out the potentiality within the hero, right? He, to, to bring out this um, unrealized highest manifestation that one is capable of. Um, in other words, we might call it your mission or your life purpose. And that was what he was particularly skilled at and highly sought after for was that ability, as well as all of the arts that he knew. Um, so that, to a certain degree, that whole point, and these are heroes, these are called classical heroes that Chiron is tutoring. So that's half of the heroes. That's half of the hero's journey, right? That's half of what the soul's job is. The mastery of the terrestrial world, right? Individuation through test and trial, then purification, perfection of one's latent ability, you know, through the process of individuation that brings out one's own power and potential in a way that it had never been realized before and then given as a gift to humanity. That is the classic um, hero's myth, but that's only half of it, right? And interestingly, Melanie, uh, Melanie Reinhardt writes about Chiron and talks about that he's the anti-hero because the hero usually accomplishes all of those things. And in the myth, Chiron doesn't, he doesn't conquer the wound. Well, at least on the material plane, he doesn't. He becomes wounded by, um, by, by Hercules, right? From an arrow that was dipped into Hydra's poison. And then he kind of retreats to his cave, um, which echoes to me, which echoes the descent journey right, which then I call that the heroine's journey, or I'm not the only one that calls it that, but it's the heroine's journey to me, the descent. And that um, alludes back to what I was talking about, Inanna, and her descent, where she goes to meet Arishkigel in the underworld, and then is, um, appears to be dead, um, and hung on a hook for three days. And these little beings are sent down to get her to be a long story I won't get into. But the important point was these little beings come down. Arishkigel in, in transpersonal psychology would be looked at as the disowned parts of the psyche, right? The rage and the grief and the primal disowned parts of the psyche. And so Inanna then goes down um, and and faces that, faces the raging Arishkigel. And like I said, she kind of kills her. And then the, they send down these little beings and the little beings sympathize with Arishkigel. And in the myth, they say, oh, Arishkigel said, ow, ow. And you know, the little beings were like, ow, ow. And that pleased Arishkigel, which then returned um, Inanna to life. And she uh, went back up um, out of the underworld. Um, the point being there that both parts of this, right, in patriarchal culture, the hero's journey is the one that's, you know, elaborated upon everything we can do in the upper world, the terrestrial world, conquer things with our mind and our reason and all of those things, right? But in Chiron's story, he doesn't do that. Um, you know, in fact, he's like Melanie Reinhardt said, he's kind of the anti-hero, yet he's the tutor to the heroes because his own wound is unhealable and he has to go into his cave and face that. So, you know, to me, um, Chiron as a master healer in the material world um, now kind of needs to go face his own primordial wound. Um, and as the myth goes on, that is what eventually liberates him, eventually gives him true immortality. Uh, but again, alluding back to shamanism and this fusion of um, uh, human and animal um, shape-shifting and traveling between the worlds and all of that, 
um, the shaman is often a shaman or shamanka is often initiated into their art through a healing crisis. And all, quite often it's a deadly he healing crisis. It's often a brush with death. Um, so again, part of Chiron's story, you know, alludes to all of these things um, that are part of the, I'm sorry, I, I noticed something in the picture that I hadn't seen before. Um, and I was just wondering what part of, what part that the woman suckling the baby in the corner, I hadn't seen that before. Okay, like I said, it's hard to find a lot of Chiron, <laughs> Chiron graphics. So you'll have to do with what I could find. Um, so Chiron, you know, it, as we know, becomes, is this master healer before he's wounded. And, and in fact, in one of the stories, as you know, uh, he was often not only brought the babies of, you know, these heroes as they were babies to tutor and to mentor and to raise actually, but he was brought many um, mythical characters to, to heal as well. And Telephus is one who went to him. Um, and Telephus was wounded by a spear and went to the Oracle of Apollo to find out how to get the healing for this wound. And the Oracle of Apollo told him the wound can only be healed by its cause. Now, this is the heart of Chiron's healing power. Um, Chiron and Uranus to a certain degree, I've always associated with homeopathic medicine. Um, and one of, you know, the principles of homeopathic medicine is to stimulate like cures like, is to stimulate the wound with more of the same to bring out this latent healing within the organism itself. Um, this is the exact method of how the soul seeks to heal itself. Um, and this is why trauma is recreated life after life. It's not a punishment. You know, it's not stupidity. It's not that you didn't get it. <laughs> it's that it was unable to be reconciled. It was unable to be rectified. It was, un you were unable to put together the fragmented parts from whatever traumas. Um, and so the soul, again, picking up where it left off, recreates that again, right? Um, so that it can be healed particularly and hopefully at a higher turn of the spiral and not just on a repetition, but that higher turn of the spiral comes from the, um, in, in the re-insinuation of the wound that then stimulates something within, right? The breaking of light into consciousness that where we go, aha, right? I don't have to do that anymore. So something gets released from like cures like, the similar circumstance re-triggers the original wound, which is then brought to the fore of consciousness. And as I always say, um, wound, the, the wound brings pain, pain brings attention and attention brings healing. Another way of saying that is when we, when we, when our consciousness, when a deeper level or higher level of consciousness, whatever way you want to look at it, is stimulated, that's when um, healing, real healing happens. So, um, you know, homeopathic medicine is diluted. You know, you know that 32 times, 10 times, I hit 100 times. Um, like Chiron. Chiron himself is this diluted, diluted, not diluted, I'm sorry, <laughs> the diluted echo, right? This distant echo of this past wound that is, it, it shows up as a present day wound, again, in our primal um, sources of love, but the present day wound isn't the source, right? 
So this is why sometimes just spending all the time on rectifying your relationship with your parents doesn't always cause massive enlightenment, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, it causes some levels of, of liberation, but there's more to it than that. Um, because you need to go back to the source, right? The resonance of the wound uh, being re-stimulated brings to the forefront that, or can bring to the forefront, that which is the original cause, right? And people who've done homeopathics or practice homeopathics know that homeopathics also, because of their diluted and energetic, they're an energetic medicine right? They work directly on these subtle bodies that I was just showing you. It's not about the chemical um, because there is no chemical interaction, right? It's not about that. It's the energy and what's stimulated. But homeopathics done right and knowingly often create a cathartic response, right? They can bring uh, volatile reactions to the surface, because they stimulate the entire complex of the disease or the illness, not just treating the symptom. This is chironic medicine, right? And this is exactly what, um, well, the kind of, and it's alluded to in some of Chiron's students, um, Asclepius being one of them who became, who, who was said to have even become a greater healer than Chiron, um, had people go into, um, and there, it's a longer story to talk about Asclepius, but um, Asclepius is often said to be at the heart of depth psychology and that the, the um, first appearances of what we would today call depth psychology or transpersonal psychology actually showed up in Asclepius's um, methodologies. Okay, so we know Chiron gets wounded. Oops, sorry, I don't have any more slides left. <laughs> so I guess we'll just talk about it this way. Um, again, I ran out of images. Okay. So Chiron's wound then, there's a few versions of the myth, um, but the most common one is that he was at a party um, that Hercules had that, with all of the centaurs and things got a little crazy and out of hand and Hercules gets into a battle with the centaurs and fires off these arrows and one of them hits Chiron in his leg right, specifically the, the animal part of him. Um, and um, it was dipped, <clears throat> the arrow was dipped into the blood of Hydra. And Hydra was one of Hercules labors, right? Hercules being one of Chiron's primary, <clears throat> what he mentored as, the, as a hero. <clears throat> and the labors of Hercul Hercules, a whole other story, but Hercules cutting off the heads of Hydra and then, you know, more of them reappear, um, you know, it, oh, the heads only multiply when they get cut off, um, but it, it actually alludes to the archetype of Scorpio and brings Pluto into the myth, but I won't go there yet, <laughs> or not tonight. <laughs> um, so the, the arrow is dipped in the blood of Hydra. And what's interesting is, as I said, Asclepius being one of um, his star uh, healer pupils was given two vials of Hydra's blood. And the reason for the two vials was that um, it said that on the right side of Hydra's head was her blood was healing and on the left side, it was poison. Um, and so, you know, this also alludes to the caduceus, right, which belongs to Hermes, but then the single staff is um, Escapulus's uh, symbol. And we could say that that serpent is that unification of that which is poison also heals, right? And then the reason why it shows in, uh, as a single serpent in Asclepius's staff, is because it's showing the unification of that, right? That which wounds heals. 
Um, okay. So Chiron gets wounded from this arrow, which is dipped in Hydra's blood, and it proves to be unhealable. So Chiron tries all of, you know, everything that he knows. <laughs> he throws everything that he knows at it um, and, and is unable to heal it and is an agonizing pain. Now, in some versions of the myth, um, they say that Chiron suffered in pain for a long time, but actually there's uh, the standard or the classical, um, and I'm not sure if it was Hesiod or which version it was of the myth, um, that says, and this is, this is important, that Chiron retreats to his cave and suffers for nine days. So the number nine is interesting in um, all spiritual traditions. Um, it's a symbol of perfection. It's a symbol of unity. It's a symbol of completion, right? In numerology, it's where you bring, you wrap up everything nine before you go to the one the 10 and start the cycle over, right? Um, so it's completion and mastery. It's the final phase before the next phase of growth. Uh, interesting though, one of the reasons why the Pythagoreans amongst many mathematicians and um, you know, those that worked with numerology found nine to be fascinating is because nine reproduces itself. So if you take two times nine, that equals 18. And then you add 1.8, that equals nine, right? <laughs> if you take nine times five, that's 45. If you add four and five, that equals nine. So you can take nine as a multiple of anything and add the numbers together and you'll always come back to nine, right? So isn't that a bit of an eternal cycle? right? Also to the Greeks, the number nine uh, was called theta, and theta is associated with death. One of the most interesting correlations is that the Eleusinian mysteries took place, and this would be of importance to the Greek consciousness, is that the Eleusinian mysteries took place over nine days. Um, Nobody really knows what happens. It, it, that's the Persephone Pluto Hades, uh, Pluto uh, uh, Demeter story. And the myth or, or the, um, the rites that were enacted are unknown because it was said on the pain of death, no initiate was able to reveal what happened during the Eleusinian mysteries. But it is, has been said that one has, who has undergone the mysteries, which took place underground in caves, probably involved hallucinogens, right? And probably involved bringing the, just like in the shamanic initiation, bringing the, the initiate to the point of death and then resurrection, right? Again, think of the myth of Demeter, Persephone and Pluto, the enactment of the Eleusinian mysteries was, was um, all about that myth. Um, but it was said that those who came through the mysteries never feared death again. Um, and that would be because they experienced the potentiality of immortality somehow through those rites. So the nine being very important to Greek, um, you know, to the Greek consciousness at the time. Now in the myth, Ch Chiron's in his cave for nine days. Like I said, I think Chiron is needing to face his primordial wound and do the heroin side of the journey, which is the descent, which I, you know, it's not written about what he did then except moan in pain. <laughs> But I think that, you know, to me, if I were to interject into the story, I would say that's what was happening. And then eventually Hercules um, mediates Chiron's release from his agony. Now, interesting, the, the fact that Hercules reappears in the myth because he's the one who wounded Chiron also alludes to the fact that the thing that wounds brings the ability to heal, right? The very thing <clears throat> that wounds can bring healing. So Hercules mediates this deal with Zeus 
and that Chiron wishes to take place of Prometheus, who's been punished by the gods for stealing the fire from the gods, um, from Zeus, stealing the fire and giving it to humanity, i.e. bringing enlightened consciousness to humanity, or in some interpretations, bringing the arts of civilization to humanity, right? But more transpersonally, um, consciousness itself. Um, because in some versions of the myth, Prometheus actually creates humanity. So Prometheus has been punished for stealing the fire from the gods and he's been chained to a rock. And while he's chained to the rock, um, in again, different versions, an eagle or this griffin kind of being comes and pecks out his liver every night and then it grows back. <laughs> And he suffers this for eternity, right? And then the next day it gets pecked out again. That was his punishment. So um, Chiron, bro deal brokered by Hercules, Chiron um, says, take me instead of Prometheus and I'll give up my immortality because Chiron is immortal. And that's exactly what happens. So Chiron takes his place and then is awarded um, liberation actually, and becomes the constellation Centaurus to the, uh, to the Greeks. Not necessarily Sagittarius, although some people make that association. Um, okay, some takeaways from the story. Hold on, I need moisture. <laughs> Okay, some takeaways from the story. You know, I contemplated this. Um, Chiron, even though we associate it, and there's a lot of reasons why Chiron is associated as the wounded healer, um, Chiron doesn't become wounded until after he's already a master healer. It's at the very end of his story where he becomes wounded. Um, he's already kind of, you know, he's already mastered the all of healing, um, but his wounding points to this kind of injustice of the primordial wound, right? Because, you know, if you think about it, Chiron's doing his thing, he's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing, and then bam, you know, he gets, he gets um, wounded. But like I said, it points to this injustice of the primordial wound. I mean, if you look at the Garden of Eden story, right, being cast out of the garden, I mean, what are we supposed to make of that? <laughs> Eve takes a bite out of an apple and that's it, bam, you're banished, you're done, right? Cast out of the garden, shame and banishment. Um, so Chiron, <clears throat> Chiron's first wound, as, as I said, going back to his being orphaned, the abandonment is a spirit and soul wound. Um, because again, he takes that wound and is luckily adopted by Apollo and Artemis. Um, he takes that wound and he turns it into gold, right? So the dross that he's been given, he spins into gold and he becomes the best that he can be. And perhaps we might say at the peak of his achievements, he's wounded beyond healing. And the only thing left for him to do is to kind of turn his back on all of those accomplishments, right? Because there's something greater for him to gain which is the real liberation. And Prometheus representation in this myth, as we know, Prometheus, Prometheus has been associated with the planet Uranus, right? It is the liberating force. It's associated with not just liberation, but individuation um, as well. So Chiron is kind of the hero's journey in reverse. Um, as Melanie Reinhardt said, she called him the anti-hero. But as I associate Chiron's myth with the classic hero's journey that, say, comes from Joseph Campbell, you know, I made these correlations a long time ago. And to me, because the hero's journey, you know, not the classical Greek heroes that, um, you know, master the terrestrial world, 
Um, but the transpersonal journey, which is about when you get to that point of turning against the terrestrial world for a greater attainment, which would be the spiritual journey, that point where you hear the call of return and start the path of return, that's the hero's journey, which has elements of the heroine's journey as, as a necessary part of it so that the healing and the rectification of ego to soul to spirit can happen, right? So in the hero's journey, I made this correlation a while ago that Sagittarius is actually the beginning of the hero's journey, the centaur, right? But this is where the centaur and, and in the classic hero's journey now using Joseph Campbell's language, this is where the centaur or the, the hero hears the call and they leave the known into the unknown, right? I've made correlations of the hero's journey to say Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, which are modern hero's journey myths uh, and, and classic stories. Uh, and so that would be like when Frodo leaves the Shire, right? Or Luke goes to find Yoda, leaves his planet, what's it called? Tatiuni or something leaving the known that's the separation right that's the separation from the known sagittarius that's where it happens and then in the next sign capricorn like i said these last three signs are the most um transpersonal it's the most transpersonal quadrant of the zodiac so in this last in capricorn this is where mastery of the physical world happens right and one then eventually tires of all of those ambitions, all of those accomplishments and turns their back. As I say, it's like the goat climbs the top of the mountain and then looks higher to the supernal light. And, and Capricorn in esoteric traditions is known as the sign of the initiate, right? And so this is where, this is where the, the spiritual journey begins the turning of one's back on the all of that's been accomplished, the mastery. And, you know, um, again, Chiron represented some of this, um, but in reverse, because all the heroes that he's tutoring are doing this journey that I was talking about from Sag to Capricorn. And then the hero's journey also reveals um, individuation in Aquarius. This is where, um, you know, this is where one perfects, one deconditions, one's turned their back on man-made law, right? And conditioning and societal and familial and all of those bands that I was talking about, they start deconditioning from that to what? To reveal through the process of individuation, to reveal that which is that divine spark that is within the individuated consciousness which is totally unique to you, right? That is the process of individuation. It's about revealing that which is absolutely unique. And it is that individuated spark within. And that uniqueness then becomes your gift to humanity, right? The spark of one's individuality, again, thinking of the sign of Aquarius, then pours out that is the water bearer pouring out that gift to humanity. And then the next step that happens in the hero's journey associated with Pisces is the ultimate sacrifice of even that, right? That is all forsaken, that is all given up, that is all sacrificed so that everything that one has perfected and treasured is then handed over in what the stage that Joseph Campbell calls the apotheosis, one becomes deified themselves, right? That is the rectification with the divine. That is the having done that journey. Now, the interesting thing is none of Chiron's heroes ever get to the last stage, but Chiron himself does. This is why he's the anti-hero, right? This is my own contemplation on that as I looked at it. And I'm thinking, yes, of course, Chiron already had all of the mastery. That's why he could turn and teach all of these great heroes. Um, and from he, that stimulated from his own wound, like I said, he made gold out of the dross. And, um, 
and and had this realized potential or had the um the the ability to bring out that unreal that unrealized potential into manifestation so he does the he does the hero's journey he's already several steps ahead of the heroes that have um that he tutors uh, they don't reach that immortal status that Chiron does. The ultimate sacrifice that Chiron giving of himself to release Prometheus um, because he chooses to die because of the pain, right? So Chiron basically says, basically, I'm on the path of return now. I'm in the final stage. All of this, I'm going to surrender. All of the pain, all of the, the everything, like he's done with it, and he is able to return to oneness because of that, right? He then um, becomes immortalized, uh, the real immortality. What Joseph Campbell called the the great boom, right? That which is again the apotheosis, one who becomes deified. So he's reconciled after going into his cave um, and going into the wound itself. I suppose Chiron's conclusion was that there's nothing left to do here. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I can actually return to the source, right? And in that I can liberate Prometheus, Uranus, um, you know, to continue to carry on the flame. And this is also part of that, those last stages of the hero's journey that Chiron enacts by having so many pupils and so many, um, he passes on the torch, right? Which is that kind of Aquarian stage, um, just like Prometheus passed on fire to humanity. Um, I'm getting a really dry throat, so excuse me. Okay, in conclusion, and a few other thoughts afterwards, but in conclusion, I want to leave you with this, um, <clears throat> this quote from Rumi, mystic. I'm sure you all know who he was. <laughs> Rumi says, your doctor must have a broken leg to doctor. Your defects are the ways that glory gets manifested. Whoever sees clearly what's diseased in himself begins to gallop on the way. Don't turn your head. Keep looking at the bandaged place. That's where the light enters you. So this is the Chiron wound, right? If we can track from the present life circumstances back to into the memory of the soul, to the past life circumstances, clear those up, right? Track back to the primordial wound, right? That is the process, that alchemical process that Chiron represents of being able to enact the return in the same way that the descent happened. Um, one thing or a few things I'd like to say about Asclepius before we end. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is I think Asclepius is so central to um, the Chiron story because Asclepian healing methods are very mysterious. Um, and he took Chiron's healing ability further. Like I said, he was known to have excelled his own teacher. And Asclepius, um, some of the rites of Asclepius or the way that one would get healing from Asclepius in ancient times was they had to go through a purification stage first. And this is known as catharsis. Today in psychology, we call this catharsis, right? Is again, purgation of that which has been repressed that breaks through the um, boundary or the defense of ego as much as you don't want it to. <laughs> Right, as much as ego tries to continue to repress the fears and the anxieties and the irrational, because that's what the ego does, right? It suppresses the irrational. 
Um, but of course it's irrational because the source of those wounds are not always the current life. Um, so catharsis then is enacted first in, in the Asclepian healing methods. So catharsis is, um, you know, often enacted through rites of purification and, and diet and, um, you know, fasting and meditation. So all of these preparations would happen. Um, and the patient, the one who was coming for Asclepian healing would then, you know, make some offering um, to the temple. And then what would happen later so the catharsis needs to happen first. The cleansing, the purgation needs to happen first. That's my point. And then um, the, the patient would go into the caves of Asclepius and sleep because Asclepian was dream therapy. And what would happen was that the intention of the dream, you know, one would go to sleep with the intention of, and, and, you know, it's also said that perhaps just like the Eleusinian mysteries, maybe they used hallucinogens as well. Maybe they were doing ayahuasca or peyote or something there, or soma, whatever was known in those parts of the world. Um, they would go um, to sleep and pray to be um, visited by Asclepius himself or, um, Hygieia or Panacea, which were two of his healing daughters as well. And in the dream uh, would be the prescription. And um, if the patient didn't understand the dream, they would then consult with the priests or priestesses of the temple who then would work psychotherapeutically with them, right? This is where Asclepius gets that association with um, the roots of a modern psychotherapy, they would um, you know, analyze the dream together and open up its meaning so that the, um, the divine treatment that was then you know, prescribed could be enacted. Um, so my point with that is that um, those of you who are gonna go, on the, go to the workshop, like I said, in the workshop, what I'm, going to do is uh, first, you know, talk a little bit more about some of summarizing what I talked about tonight, and then um, taking Chiron through the signs to kind of stimulate our understanding of how it manifests as that primordial wound and informs um, many lifetimes and the primal wound, and then um, take you on a journey yourself. Um, perhaps back to even if we just glance or knock around the edges of that primordial separation, the amount of healing and insight that can come from that um, is like going into what they would call these incubating dreams. So what I was going to say, the reason why I was telling you about the Asclepian healing is that if you're coming to the workshop, what you might want to do over the next couple nights is go to sleep with the intention of receiving a Chiron healing dream and see what comes to you. You might want to do some um, ritual of cleansing. You might wanna make your bedroom a bit temple-like with some incense and candles and make this intention before going to sleep. Um, either it's a particular, anything, that you have that's surfacing in your current life, if it's gone into with these eyes, right? With the eyes or the consciousness of knowing what can be revealed through it, you can sniff through it back to the primordial wound. So we could say that, you know, you could go to sleep with a particular illness that's surfacing in your life, a, an emotional pain, you know, a mental quandary, whatever, whatever plane it's showing up on, whatever subtle body, and then record your dreams and see what comes out of that. And you have two nights to do that before the workshop. <clears throat> okay. So All right. of course I knew I wouldn't just be one and 15 minutes or whatever it was supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and you were wondering if you would if if you didn't have too much time. I know if I didn't have if I if I, had, <laughs> if I wanted to be shorter because of the yeah. time or you know stick to the short schedule because of the time yeah well, that was gonna happen yeah right I know <laughs> so let, let's just see are there any questions or thoughts or anything anybody wants to share Did it make sense? Absolutely, it was fabulous, Patricia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent, oh, wonderful, really, really beautiful. Thank you. I love the stories. Mm -hmm. hey, may I ask you a question then? Please, Please. yeah. Well, that's, that's that, thank you. That was that is just excellent. Uh, there's so much to digest in what you brought up, and so much thought. Anyway. Um, do you, when you're looking, when you're doing this work with someone and you're looking at someone's chart, you're incorporating that, do you actually look at the asteroid Asclepius in the chart? No, well? you know what? I'm going to start doing that though more. Well, there's so many that you could, because you could put in, you know, you could put in so many of them, right? Um, that's a problem. <laughs> but it might be interesting, you know? If Thank you start bringing in all the centaurs and all of the other, you know, uh, asteroids that are also represented as part of, uh, from the, even just this myth, you have a whole. Hygieia would be easy to do. Yeah. Yes. I just yeah. wonder almost how they would map out on someone's chart, you know, yeah. just if there was yeah. a consistency for you with what you see, you know, anyway, mm. it's interesting what, who you've brought up today. So thank you. Anyone, any questions or anything? Yes, Patricia, can, am I, my microphone close enough? You can hear yes, me? Yes, I can hear okay, you. Okay, hi. The story I love all about Inanna, of course, going down to see her sister. The little parts, I've forgotten that part. So if you could just clarify, the one thing is, okay, so her sister is excited to see that there's ow, ow, ow. And I'm trying to connect that, that in a sense that might be where if the sister was in death, numbed to some of these grief and all that. But if you could just clarify no, that Erishkigel part. is the one who is the Erishkigel, again, in, in a transpersonal yes. um, analysis of that. Arishkigel is the dis is a dissociated part of Inanna. I mean, I have other oh, I have other okay. so she she is kind of a part of Inanna, or even we could say a part of the feminine that's not yes. allowed. The raging, the grieving, the raw, the primal. Yes. Arishkigel represents that, and she's in the underworld. Inanna goes to visit Arishkigel. But what yes. I love about the classic interpretation of Inanna's myth. Um, is that the myth opens with it saying, Inanna put her ear to the ground and answered the call. So Inanna initiates the descent, unlike the Persephone myth where she's kidnapped and you know raped mm -hmm. and all of that, right? Inanna willingly goes to the underworld. This is the heroine's journey. Right. I, that to me is the power of that. And she goes to reconcile. Now, there's more to it because what I was talking about before, I also believe that Inanna's story is, is also a tale of funerary rites and is also an echo of the books of the dead that were in detail mm -hmm. outlined by Bone to Bone Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism and the Egyptians, right? Um, and Samaria was around that time as well. And I think that contained within that myth, there is some um, also like the books of the dead that show the process of reconciliation of all of these different parts of, this, of the, the self, right? To, to have the ultimate resurrection that Inanna has, because it's said that she hung for three days yes. like she was dead, and then she's resurrected. No, so I... the little beings that come are the ones that come to tame, to, to appease Arishkigel, 
right? Well, that's what I was curious. Right. So yeah. she's raging down there and she strikes Inanna dead and hangs yeah. her on a hook. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, up in the upper world, everybody's trying to figure out how to get Inanna back, right? And Inanna had a plan before she went, you know, she told Ned Vishavar, like, you know, if I don't show up, here's the plan. If I don't come back, here's the plan, right? She already had it laid out. But these little beings were created that went down and they sympathized with Arishkagel. In other words, they represent the part that recognized the pain. Okay, right? that's what I was grabbing. The willingness, yeah, it's to, go, the willingness yes. to go was the Ninana's part of the story. And these little beings represent the, the the recognition of the pain yeah grief does need a witness it does need yeah. that holding it's true yeah. and it also That's reminds me that that the liver i think also represents grief the seed of emotion yeah so it's yeah. a fascinating yeah well it's not fascinating it's just life force isn't it but there is the grief that we to get back right. to the joy but thank all you all right thank everyone you. i'm sorry to say that i know Patricia, even though it's 1230 almost, you could go on and on and on as I can see. This, you're not ready to sleep yet. But um, if you have more questions, obviously you can go and go to the workshop. And if you get there before midnight on the other parts of the world, then you can still get the discount. If you're beyond that, then I apologize. Uh, you should have done it earlier. And having said that, I have to say good night and that right. the rest yeah the i would i would say from a treasurer's point of view if the registration is in before midnight pacific time then it would count as far as i'm concerned so if you get it in tonight Perfect. then 